Mr. Dirk Lower. And uh, you are uh, Taxation and Ecological Economics, Faculty of Environmental Business Management in Luxembourg? No, in Germany, in Trier, where Karl Marx is born. Ah, so you're a Marxist? No. Yeah. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Almost got a heart attack now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and what, what exactly is that you are uh, bringing? What message are you bringing here to the Peace Forum? Oh, we're talking about land grabbing and a basic message is that land grabbing is rent grabbing. This means uh, many investors are looking for the yields out of the land. They're investing in order to get a lot of yields out of the land. On the other hand, they are paying almost nothing to the community, to these states. Uh, and this is a problem because this pushes a lot of problems in the land sector. Like what? Like what? Like that they are coming big investors, they see that they can make a lot of money, for example, by violating laws, for example, by illegal logging, by kicking off the people who are long time living there and um, then taking the land and manage the land or selling the land and sharing the revenues with some influential politicians, with some influential guys from the political elite. And um, so this game is at the expense of poor organized people and in favor of a class of rich investors and politicians. And are they doing it legally or illegally? Uh, are, are they doing it through legal means? Um, in most cases, such states, they have uh, formally good laws, but very often these laws are violated or sometimes um, these laws are also working against these um, losing people. For example, they introduce property rights. You know? um, people who are long living there are illiterate. They cannot read or write. You know? They don't know about property rights. They only know they are living there since generations. So what happens? One day there comes a uh, uh, troop, uh, policemen, army or whatever and they say guys you have to leave within half an hour uh, because it's our land and they say oh we are living here since generations and they say where's your title and they don't know about a title even if they knew about their rights they didn't have money to pursue their rights and even if they had money they would meet corrupt judges corrupt courts so they have no chance you're talking of you're talking of germany luxembourg or you're talking of the world no i'm talking about uh, i'm talking of many developing countries threshold countries but even when you're talking about uh, such countries as germany and luxembourg in germany we also discussed this phenomenon of land grabbing, particularly in the east, in eastern Germany, because there were many poor um, farmers. farmers and there were investors who looked where are poor farmers, where, which houses in, are in a poor condition. They certainly have problems and then they made offers to take over the land. And most of these farmers are still living on the land as kind of manager, but they don't own the land anymore. So. The farming middle class is eroding also in Germany. Uh -huh. So you're talking of the ex-Soviet Union countries? Uh, this is Eastern Germany. In Western Germany we also have this, but not that extreme. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, so you think that uh, before they, w they had some protection because the government owned all the land and now uh, wealthy people can come and, and, and buy it off uh, the farmers? No, many wealthy people come and take it off, that's right. But I think um, if you're looking at agriculture, the main problems we don't face in Europe or elsewhere we face it 
in development countries, developed countries, because when you're looking, where do we have most people, um, most hungry people? Where are the people starving? Eh? They are starving where the land is the best. In Sub-Saharan Africa or in Southeast Asia, they are not starving where it's desert or something. They are starving where the land is the best because they have no access, because the land is grabbed. Uh, my uh, question is about uh, the legality of it. If uh, the people in, in any country develop certain rules that say this is what you can do with your land, uh, is it the fault of the poor farmers that don't know what they're doing or is it fault of the law of uh, the lack of regulations from a government that is conscious of this happening? Um, these laws are sort of tool, an instrument, and there are some guys who know to play this tool very well. And these are the rich and powerful people. And there are other guys who cannot play with this tool. And these are the poor farmers. And so uh, in formal terms, uh, we have equal rights. But in fact, only one group can play with these tools. And it does happen in both underdeveloped countries and also developed countries. Uh, more in underdeveloped countries. And this is also a problem because very often de uh, developed countries, they try to export their system of property rights, their legal system in an environment which is working completely different. Huh? Mm -hmm. For example, I was working for three years um, as a consultant for a uh, German development organization. They have a very excellent law but this law is only a facade because behind the law things are completely different. How are we going to solve that problem? Who is going to change those laws so they will protect the land basically? I think um, we have to change our minds in some regards. One important thing is um, such states need a strong state to protect also such weak groups. Hmm? But how to get a strong state? A strong state is a state who is independent also from some special powerful interests. Hmm? Um, for me it is very important to have a taxation system that takes off these rents which are grabbed. This is one thing which is very necessary. Um, for example, such a state can say, okay, I taxing heavier the land, what did they do in Cambodia? They exempted yeah. these guys from taxation. They should do the opposite, tax them more. For example, if they can earn some 2,000 euro per hectare with oil palms, they to, should take some 1,000 or 1,500 and not 5 euros. Eh? This would be one thing. So the state would be able to pay his civil servants. They shouldn't be so corrupt anymore if they get a good payment. And they also could be able to protect these weak groups in a better way than they are doing now. But then that government will be accused of being Marxist. Um, this is not Marxism. The opposite is the case. For example, they could be, if they change the system to more land taxation, they could offer, for example, foreign direct investors come to us, we lower the corporate in income tax, for example, huh? or we lower the income tax, we take it from other sources. This is, for example, also a way which the OECD also proposes. This is not Marxism. Huh? You should tax um, factors of production which are not able to escape, not able to flee. You don't have efficiency losses, it's the best way to do it. Huh? But you want to tax the... the the profits from, say, uh, minerals or oil. Also, you, also. You, you want to hire those taxes. Also. But on the same, on the same token, you're saying you want to lower the investors' taxes. So somebody has to profit. Somebody so has to profit. You're take it from one pocket and put it in the other pocket. Yeah, on the one hand, yes, but in an intelligent manner. Because if some people create something, if they set up some, for example, some factories or something, which um, really developed the country, they shouldn't be taxed so much. But if they take something um, which is simply there and it is not uh, by their resources. own natural resources, it's not by their own efforts, um, uh, there's no reason not to take it.
either it is uh, it, it comes into a private pocket or in the public pocket so why doesn't the state take it huh? yeah. well, investment has also come uh, to a private pocket and the end investors that come from other countries and we facilitate him make to make them wealthier by using this uh, investment money from wherever it comes um, yeah, but investments from other countries, if they help to set up new industry and so on, it's not bad. Eh? If they simply take away the natural resources, eh? and for example, if they, for oil or something, if they um, have some expenses of $30 for one barrel, if they sell it for 120 barrel, this difference, why not take it away? They only need to be covered, to have covered the costs. Yeah, I think the problem is who is going to take it away? We need a strong state, but uh -huh. we only get a strong state if the state has money. <laughs> and so, it's a catch it, is, it, is it the egg or is it the hen? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because who is going to elect these politicians that are going to regulate higher taxes? But the wealthy landlords. I think what um, this is a big task of our development policy um, right now, as far as I can see, as far as I've experienced, our um, development policy has the idea, it comes from Hernando de Soto, it was an uh, influential political advisor and author, he said, the poor people on this world um, are rich, but they have no property rights, we should give them titles and then everything is okay. But this is not enough, by far not enough. Perhaps in the future we can have, a, a, what do you call it, land trusts, where the land is not owned by individuals, but by cooperatives or something, where you cannot sell for profit. This would be a progress, indeed. Yes, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And okay. thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. The purpose of this forum is to promote the idea of world peace in its true sense, in its complete sense. And we try to see uh, the peace at the micro level, and we also see the peace at the macro level, at, a, at the level of countries, nations, and world. Mm -hmm. So micro, you mean personal, individual? Uh, micro is personal, individual. Micro is the way we are behaving on a day-to-day -day basis. Our reaction to a particular situation is a micro level. As uh, individuals. As, as an individual. Yeah. If we get angry on a particular point, that means that's a micro level and that shows that what is our reaction, what is our transaction to a particular event and that is the micro level manifestation of peace. And macro would be nation to nation. And macro will be na nation to nation and maybe continent to continent. Mm -hmm. Maybe European Union as such and its disposition towards uh, other region. Right, yes. empires that uh, yeah. get together with other countries and uh, yes. decide to be on a different side and uh, we have this confrontation. So uh, you, uh, you are promoting peace how here? We are promoting peace uh, through conducting a number of workshops. We have got workshops uh, around the issue of, of uh, of the corporate worlds coming and participating. We have got NGOs, we have universities, we have got at the government level, European Parliament participating. What do you expect Parliament to do? The Parliament, like we are now sitting in the European Parliament. And this itself is a big achievement for us. We have got the recognition for the efforts which we are making towards bringing peace. And uh, when we are here, when our delegates are here and we are talking about, we get to have a sense of what the legislatures have been going through, how they think about. We also had the representative from the European Parliament uh, sitting through our discussions. And that helps us um, to understand them well and they understanding us what we are trying to achieve. And I think this is the first step towards building the bridge. Mm -hmm. For them to understand parliament. yes, that there is an alternative way of resolving conflicts other than war. Yes. Okay. And do you expect the parliament to legislate some 
kind of uh, new uh, rule uh, department of peace. Yeah, what what we uh, expect now is the thinking to change. We are not expecting uh, some new laws to be immediately passed, but we are influencing certain thinking. Like for example, we had a very good discussion yesterday on uh, Ministry of Peace, or Peace Creation of Peace Ministry. Now, this is a novel initiative which World Peace Forum launched about four years back. Uh, thereby, we urged the nations, the governments around the globe to consider to institute or create a Ministry of Peace. So the Department of Defense assumes that there is an enemy out there that you have to defend yourself from. Right. Now, with the Department of Defense also, uh, now over the years, uh, we believe that there are certain issues in the basic thinking. While it's a huge improvement than what it was earlier, but still, it's not completely there. We could see now in the world, um, if you look at the statistics of the wars which were conducted in 2013, and I have a report on that, this has been compiled by Heidelberg Institute of Peace and Conflict Research. And this, this reports talk about is that there were 45 wars in 2013. Most of us in Europe and some countries, we don't realize what's going on, or there have been so many wars, but it has given account of all of them and has put down by the country and the conflict zones. And if they take into account all the violent conflicts, violent and non-violent conflicts, then there have been 415 cases of conflicts. Now, is it different than, say, 100 years ago? Or is it, uh, has it increased or is it the same? Uh, I think compared to 100 years ago, because we are talking about World War I in 1914, it has decreased. In World War I, there were 9 million lives were lost. Last year, this year, we have not lost that much life to uh, not even you know, a small percentage of that. Uh, but what we are still seeing is that in absolute number, the figures of the lives lost due to war and the violent conflicts are uh, very high and worrisome. And if I compare, com compare to 2008, if we see what was in 2013, then there have been a rise, rise to the extent of 15 to 20 percent. Oh, really? And also the economic resources yeah. and human resources that are devoted to, to war, yeah. I guess, uh, come into those uh, considerations. Yeah. yeah. There have been a big, uh, big issue, psychological issue. Uh, the people who die in war, they are always being, uh, being called martyrs and martyrdom and martyrdom to, 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 to encourage the peoples who are behind to prepare the new generation to come and to see that how those who have lost their lives, how they are being given Heroes. so much of uh, yeah, honor and hero. And there is a, a false sense of achievement, I'd like to say so. My idea is not to uh, sort of you know, look down upon those who have lost their lives or those families who have contributed and sacrificed uh, their sons for their lives in the wars. But my, my idea or our idea is not to to, to, to belittle their uh, contribution to this. But the way governments play it up, the governments play up the death in the war as if this was the best thing a soldier or a youth could have done, sort of you know, misguides the other youths in the country to come forward into that. Now just imagine two scenario, a 24 year old leaving you know, American soil, soil or other, and going to say Afghanistan or Iraq or some other country and giving away his life there uh, because some, some bomb has blasted, that's all. He was in a truck or something and he loses his life. Compared to that life being lost, compared to a person, someone else, another youth, going into an education and becoming a great writer or maybe a great computer programmer or a professional or a businessman or something like this, how much value he can add to the world. To Just imagine if you would have lost Steve Jobs into say some war, some silly war in some country, it would have been a great loss for the humanity. My name is Swalka, my name is the 
but ultimately you want them to legislate maybe part of a budget and instead of going to the Department of War or Defense yeah. and going into the Department of Peace. Right, and, right. and are there some examples that uh, you can think of where it's already happened? Yeah, sure. Um, w one of the ideas which we are also debating is that um, to encourage the legislators that if they are approving $5 billion or $10 billion for purchase of arms and ammunition, mm -hmm. then a percentage of that, maybe half a percent or one percent, should go to initiatives like water aid because there are children dying when they don't have access to drinking water. The children who don't have access to the essential medicines or maybe uh, to, to education, they are dying, they are, they are losing out there. And we are spending uh, one billion on a fighter plane like Stealth. But there is already some legislation or some agreement among countries that is 0 0.07 of a dollar or a percentage of uh, GDP would go to aid. And sure. some countries are compliant with it. I, I would like to bring up the example of uh, Bhutan. Bhutan. Uh, that's a country which believes in not in GDP, but it says it measures its progress and progress by uh, gross happiness in the country. So n not gross domestic product, nor per capita income, but per capita happiness. Yeah. Do they have an army? Uh, and they measure. Uh, they, they do have a small army, but they uh, try not to be belligerent at all, and they are not army-wise or militarily quite active, and they want to promote uh, this. Now, I'd like to bring another country into example, which is Nepal. Nepal has got created Ministry of Peace and Reconstruction, mm -hmm. because they have seen the devastation of the conflict in their country, and how it has devastated them. Mm -hmm. So they are not uh, trying to build more, more of military power, but trying to rebuild themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, you uh, would agree that uh, perhaps joining uh, mili international military forces like NATO yeah. is uh, counterproductive to peace? Um, no, in case there is just one universal army, then possibly this will support the peace initiative. In a way, all the countries don't have to keep on keeping the army, they don't have to keep on buying the guns. Because the more there are guns in the system, the more there could be, there is a higher chance of you know, misuse of it, the risk, and the violence could happen. Mm -hmm. Well, that, but, the, the, yeah. the, the kings would have said the same, same thing about democracy. Yeah. If only one person rules, there is no problem for, for uh, dissent. And if yeah. you have only one army that dominates, uh, the issue would be whose ideology that army follows. Right. And I think for that, a lot of groundwork has to be done. But thankfully, we have got now uh, international institutions like United Nations, and and they could they need to do uh, you know, work on this. And really, uh, the the concept of peacekeeping forces should be elaborated, and and it should really bring in peace. Do you think that uh, NATO undermines the peace uh, forces from the United Nations? No, I think NATO is more defensive towards uh, EU and EU interests. It's not towards enforcing peace outside of EU. EU what's EU? Uh, EU means European Union. Oh, EU. Yeah, okay. uh, EU. Uh, so I feel NATO is more focused about European Union and uh, North America, uh, but uh, United uh, Nations, the peacekeeping force is more universal and accepted well and considered to be neutral. Right, so they're two separate they're, forces. They're, they're, they're two separate forces and their objectives are different. And you know that when the United Nations does not approve of uh, some mission, then NATO comes in and yeah. does what the United Nations does not approve yeah. it. So... Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the sad part of it. Mm. That's a very sad part of it. I think we were, this morning we were discussing about is war more profitable um, than peace. Mm -hmm. And one of the slides which we had put up up there is that, which read, is that so long as there will be profit in the war, there will be no peace. Mm -hmm. So there are profits in the war. Yep. And we have to find a way, deliberate, United Nations have to deliberate how to take the profits out of war. Mm -hmm. The moment there will be no profit left, mm -hmm. then no one will be interested in, in, in 
participating in the war. Mm -hmm. Profits from manufacturing weapons, you mean? Because Profits you're not uh, abolishing weapons. the word profit. Like uh, there was another yeah. workshop saying profit should be, the word profit should be abolished, but that's yeah, not profit. what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, what's happening that, like, take the example of Iraq. After the war there and now, there are uh, you know, contracts being given on no bid basis. So the big American companies are coming to Iraq and they are getting billions of dollars of contract without going through any competitive process. Mm -hmm. And that's the huge profit which they are making. Mm -hmm. That should be stopped. Sure. The country which has been actively participating in the war, that country should not be allowed to be into the rehabilitation process. Mm -hmm. If that country is being stopped, the country will not have any interest mm -hmm. to, be, uh, to be participating in the war and causing it and prolong it and create the destruction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They should be just excluded. So uh, profits from uh, manufacturers, how about uh, ex export of uh, weapons yeah. from one nation to another nation? Yeah. Uh, you know, there are two situations in the world and when you see this uh, diagram which is going around in that, that there are countries where the conflicts or the wars which are going on are primarily uh, uh, Africa, then Asian countries, Latin America, other, other countries which are involved in that in conflict. Whereas we see that North America, it has been shown in the diagram there has been no conflict. If you see in, in Europe also, Western Europe especially, no conflict. Uh, that's true, that's true, there have not been no conflict. But if we see the other side of it, the economy of these countries, they have been earning a lot of revenue by exporting uh, arms and ammunition, be it America or be from Europe also some of the leading countries have been doing that. So while they themselves didn't face the conflict, the question and the soul searching question here is that are they contributing to the conflicts, to the wars, by exporting weapons to all these countries? But if you, if you go deeper into this, who is supplying weapons to Africa, to Latin America and this? The, these countries, which are again sitting in their cozy rooms and cozy zones, they are manufacturing all AK-47s and these hand grenades and they are dropping in and they are supplying in to all these countries, sometimes free of cost. In, in Libya, expensive AK-47s were dropped from air free of cost on entire Libya almost. In Syria, it was done that. Now anyone can pick up that gun and can try out on anyone else. Maybe on a neighbor who has got a good TV and big car. Why not? Mm -hmm. So uh, you're saying the European Union and uh, North America, they are not as peaceful as they would like us to believe because yeah. we are we're manufacturing the weapons and selling right. at a profit to the third world countries right. where the conflicts are. Right. Maybe there, there's a peacefulness in their own soil and country, mm. but what they're acting and the way they are doing and exporting the uh, arms, it's causing unrest. And then sometimes this unrest comes back to their own country and their own soil. You can participate in the discussion of arms trade by going to nowpolling.ca and selecting Global Issues. And then you choose arms trade and there you will find a poll. The poll with uh, several opinions already posted. The first one said should be abolished. Arms trade should be abolished. The second one said should be regulated and enforced by the United Nations. Another one said I don't know. And the uh, last one here says works best when regulated by the free markets.